Last time we showed that NFAs and DFAs describe the same set of languages and are equally powerful. Now this actually has a big impact because NFAs made it so it was convenient for us to be able to write down the star operation and the seek and the circ operation. What we can now do is we can think more critically about those formulas um, that we can use to describe regular languages. These regular formulas are called regular expressions. Regular expressions. So we saw that we can have um, the empty set, which we write down as um, null or empty. We had epsilon. We had single characters. Those were the singleton things. We had the union operation, so we had a regular uh, a regular formula, and then a union with another regular formula. So this is union. Um, we showed star, so we can have a star. And then there was the circ operation. Circ. Now these six different ways of writing down a regular language are called regular expressions. So regular expressions, which we abbreviate as RE, is one of these six possibilities. Now, <clears throat> um, something that's that's interesting is that each one of these six possibilities um, has a convenient way that we can describe what set of languages it is. Um, and there's a convenient way of turning it into an NFA. So let's talk about each one of those things separately. So the first thing we'll do is we'll define a function called L. And what L is going to do is it's going to take a regular expression like one of these and turn it into the actual element of um, of the power set of sigma star. It's going to turn it into the actual language. Then we're going to write another function called C for compile that's going to take a regular expression and turn it into an NFA. So let's look at those functions one at a time. So first, the L function. So L of the empty set is equal, of course, to the empty set, naturally. L of epsilon is equal to the set that just contains epsilon. L of C is equal to the set that just contains that character. L of x union y is equal to L of x union L of y. L of x star is equal to L of x star. And L of x circ y is equal to L of x circ L of y. Now you may be looking at this, you may be saying, uh, Jay, this is stupid, like what is actually useful about this? And this is actually kind of the point. The point is that this L function that takes a regular expression, one of these six things, and turns it into an element of the set of languages is a trivial function. It's completely trivial and therefore um, it is easy to understand what regular expressions mean. It's easy to understand what they mean because they map perfectly to the underlying set formulas that, um, that they're talking about. Now, we can also write down that C function. So recall that the C function is going to take a regular expression and it's going to return an NFA that describes the same language. So we can call C on empty, and we're going to get back the following machine. So it loops on everything and goes to a state that accepts nothing. C of epsilon is going to go to an accepting state and then go to a state that accepts nothing. C of a single character is going to go to a rejecting state. If it sees that character, it goes to an accepting state, and if it sees anything else, then it goes to a state that does nothing. C of x union y 
is going to have an input state that has an epsilon transition to the result of calling c of x and an epsilon transition to the result of calling c of y. And then those have epsilon transitions to an accepting state. C of x star is going to have an accepting state that has an epsilon transition to the result of calling C of x with an epsilon transition back. And then finally, C of x circ y is going to have a state with an epsilon transition to calling C of x with an epsilon transition to the result of calling C of y with an epsilon transition to an accepting state. Now what this does is it shows us a mechanical way of taking regular expressions and converting them to NFAs. And the thing that is beautiful about this is that the regular expressions themselves very clearly indicate particular um, sets of strings, and those same sets of strings can be trivially converted to NFAs. And we just showed in the last class that we can trivially turn NFAs into DFAs. Let's look at a little example of this. Let's look at a regular expression that describes the third from the end is one. So the third from the end is one is we have zero union one star circ one circ zero union one circ zero union one. Okay, so that is the, um, the regular expression zero uh, third from the end is one. So let's just add parentheses to indicate what order everything happens in. And now let's mechanically convert this into an NFA. And warning, it's going to be a big NFA. So notice that it starts with a circ. So that means that we have a start state that is going to go to the result of calling compile on this block right here. That block is a star, so it's going to have a state that has an epsilon transition to the result of calling it on the union, which is here. And then that is going to have the result of calling it on zero. So zero goes to here. And then it also has an epsilon transition to this one, which says one to there. Now those two, they both have an epsilon transition to this state, which is the accepting for the union. And then that has an epsilon transition back to there. Now that one is the final state of the star. So it has an epsilon transition to the right-hand side of the circ. Now the right-hand side of the circ, it starts right here. And it is another circ. So it has an epsilon transition to this one, okay, which then has an epsilon transition to the next part of the circ, which is another circ, which has an epsilon transition to this union right here, which has an epsilon to the one for zero, and an epsilon transition for the one. And now that has an epsilon transition to the other side, to the other union, which has one for the zero, and one for the one. And then this is our accepting state. So this giant NFA right here um, is a, uh, an NFA that describes this particular language. 
And we know that it must be the case because we mechanically derived it from this formula, which uses each one of our proofs about how an operation uh, works on regular languages, on regular expressions. Now, there's a few things to say about the performance uh, of this. Now, we've never really talked about performance um, uh, about, we never really talked about performance in the context of this class before, so let's stop for a moment and think about what that even means. Think about a DFA. How long does it take a DFA to run on a string of 100 characters? Well, DFAs always run in linear time, linear in the length of the number of characters, because they always have to look at each one. So if you gave it a string of 100 characters, then it needs to, look, then it needs to take 100 steps to see what happens at the end. So they always run in linear time, linear in the number of characters. Then you can say, well, how much state do they use? How much memory do they consume? Well, they consume as much memory as there are states, right? Because they need to keep track of each one. But that's not really accurate because um, we really only need to know, um, yeah, like they, they in, in terms of how many bits we need, we need log the number of bits to keep track of the number of states. So if there were four states, then we would only need two bits to keep track of them. So a DFA, its performance is time is O, the length of the word input, and memory is O log states. So how many states that there are. Now, what about a DF an NFA? Now we can't really run an NFA directly. We always convert them to a DFA. But when we do convert them, their time is still OW because that's how they're gonna run. But what about their memory? If an NFA had five states, or sorry, four states, then how much memory would it consume? Well, we know that what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those four states and we're gonna take their power set. And that power set is going to end up being the states of the DFA. Therefore, the number of states is going to be 2 to the n, where n is the number of states in the NFA. And if we're going to take that NFA and run it as a DFA, that means that its memory is going to be log that number of states. So the number would be log 2 to the n. And log 2 to the n is just n. So its memory is linear in the number of states. That's how many bits it requires. All right, so now this regular expression right here, how much memory is it going to need? It's gonna need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. It's gonna take 24 bits. 24 bits doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually, it's kind of a lot. Um, especially because we know that we could have made this by hand. You know, like if we go back, if you go back to your notes, uh, the notes from, um, you know, the previous time when we were talking about that third from the uh, end machine, the one that we wrote by hand, it only used, I'm looking at it now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It only used eight uh, states. So only eight states means that it only used three bits. So it's actually possible to do this exact same uh, uh, problem in only three bits versus these 24. So this regular expression um, implementation right here uh, is quite uh, expensive. So that's unfortunate. Okay. So regular expressions then, they allow us to describe regular languages using these six operations and we can convert regular expressions into the languages and regular expressions into the NFAs. But there's actually a whole lot of other things that we can do with regular expressions if we treat them as abstract objects. And uh, let's spend some time talking about what some of those different options are. Now, first of all, what do I mean by abstract objects? So what I mean by that, it's like I move something a little bit. So what I mean by abstract objects is, you know, if you were doing this in a programming language like Java, you could write, you know, an interface called regex. 
And then you could write a class that was, let's call it RE for reg regex empty. And then it would have no fields. And then you could have another class called RE epsilon. And this would represent epsilons. And another one, RE char. And it would take one argument, the character. You could have re union. And it would take a regex for the left hand side and a regex for the right hand side. Another class for a star. And it would have a regex for the argument. Another class for a circ, which would have a left hand side and a right hand side. And now, what that would do is it would allow you to represent um, it would allow you to represent regular expressions like this one as objects in your programming language. So you could do something like, you know, 0 union 1 would be new re union new re char 0 and new re char 1. Okay, and that would be a particular example. And we could actually draw the whole thing out. So for instance, that third from the end, we showed that it started with a circ. So there would be a circ where its left argument was a, um, a star, and its argument was a union, and one of its arguments was a char, whose argument was zero. And then the other argument was a char, whose argument was 1. And then that circ, its right argument was another circ. And that circ's argument was this one right here. And its other argument was a circ. And one argument was this union, and the other argument was this union. And so this graph right here, of objects in a programming language describes the data structure that is this regular expression right here. Okay. Now, once we have that data structure, we can then do uh, a whole lot of operations on it. Let's look at a first really simple operation. So let's write an operation, uh, a function, that's called that's called generate. And what generate does is it's going to take a regular expression and it's going to return an example string or false. And when I say an example string or false, I mean if it's possible to generate one. So if we call gen on null, then the empty set that is, then we're going to return false because there's no example strings. But if we call gen on epsilon, then we're going to return epsilon. If we call gen on a character, then we're going to return that character. And if we call gen on um, x union y, then what we're going to do is we're going to say um, uh, we're going to say if gen x doesn't equal false, then return gen x, otherwise return gen y. And if we have gen star, x star, then let's just be easy and just always return epsilon. Actually, you know what, let's do a little trick. Let's call gen on x, sorry, on epsilon union 
um, x circ x star. And if we call gen on x circ y, what we'll do is we'll say, um, let's just make a little trick right here. I'm just going to erase that real fast. Is there something that I don't like about how I wrote it? So we'll say let gx equal gen x. Then we'll say if gx doesn't equal false, then we'll return gx. Otherwise, we'll return gen y. And then for this one, for circ, we'll say let gx equal gen x, let gy equal gen y, and then what we'll do is we'll say if gx and gy don't equal false, then return gx circ gy, otherwise return false. Okay? Now what this function is going to do is you give it a regular expression and it's going to give you an example string. Now notice that it's a little bit boring because when it gets a star it always does empty and when it gets a union it always prefers the left hand side. But what we could do is we could just make it so that right here inside of union it like flips a coin and then it like will randomly choose one of them. This is actually a really interesting function because it will give you, every time you run it, it will give you a random example regular expression. There's actually a cool thing that you can do with a function like this. You can take a regular expression. Here, let me, uh, let me give a little example of what I mean. Let me write it down rather than just like make pictures with my hands. So here's something that we know should be true. Um, for, all, for all regular expressions are if we take that regular set expression and we call compile on it, and then we call compile on that, because remember this compile compiles a regular expression and this one compiles an NFA. If we turn that regular expression into an NFA and turn the NFA into a DFA, and then call accepts DFA on that DFA, and calling generate on the regular expression, then the answer should be true always. It should always be the case that anything that you generate, if you compile that regular expression, compile it to an NFA and then run it as a DFA, it should be accepted. You can actually write this as a function, sorry, as like a program in your, in your language. You can just take a regular expression, just call generate a bunch of times, get examples, and make sure that they're actually accepted by their thing. This would be a nice way to test each one of these functions to make sure that your compiler for regular expressions, generate nets are all work together. There are other functions that you can perform. Uh, there are other operations that you can perform on regular expressions as well. And the easiest way to think about that um, is to realize that regular expressions have basically like a rich, you might call, algebraic structure. And what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is, is that... Um, is that... Think about the number... Think about with math. If I have some number n and I add zero to it, you know that you're always going to get the same number. And if you have some number and you multiply it by one, you also know you're always going to get some number. And it doesn't matter what these numbers are. Well, it turns out that regular expressions have similar properties. For example, we know that if we have null, if we have null and we union it with anything, we're going to get back that anything. And it doesn't matter what side we do the union on. Similarly, we know that if we take epsilon and we circuit to anything, it's going to be equal to just that same thing, because having the circ there doesn't matter because epsilon is just nothing. And there's actually some more interesting properties. For instance, if we have null and we circuit onto something, then that is also equal to null, 
because this null right here doesn't have any strings inside of it, so there's nothing that could possibly be accepted, so therefore it doesn't matter what comes after it. And again, that works on either side. Okay, another property that's kind of cool is, is that zero, sorry, um, null star is just equal to epsilon. Now, why is that? It's because anything starred, a star, is just equal to epsilon union a circ a star. So that means that null star is equal to epsilon union null circ null star. Well, anything on a null is just equal to uh, null, and then anything union with null is just that, so that's why it's just equal to epsilon. Similarly, epsilon star is also just equal to epsilon, because it's really the same as epsilon union epsilon circ epsilon star. Okay, and epsilon um, circ is just equal to the same thing, so it would just be epsilon union epsilon star, and anything union with itself, so if we have, so we know that a union a is just equal to a. So it doesn't matter if you add it on to itself. Okay, so there's a number of interesting properties. Now, one of the most uh, bizarre properties um, that, uh, that you can do on regular expressions is actually a derivative operation. So let's consider the derivative with respect to some character um, for each one of the elements. So the derivative with respect to some character of null is just going to be equal to null because that character is not accepted. The derivative with respect to that character of epsilon is also null because um, it's not uh, uh, there's uh, it's not accepted. Now the derivative of with respect to some character of some other character c prime. Well, it depends on if they're equal. So if c is equal to c prime, then it would be epsilon. Otherwise, it would be null. Okay. Now, the derivative of c with x union y, what's that? Well, basically, what we want to do is we want to take the derivative with respect to c of x and then union that with the derivative of y. What about star? If we have x star, then what we want there is we want to have the derivative with respect to c of x and then we want to circ that on to another instance of x star. Because we know that there's a character there, so that means that we're going to actually look inside of it. Now the last one is um, circ. So the derivative with respect to c of x circ y is a little bit more complicated. And basically the reason it's a little bit more complicated is because we need to consider what would happen if x could accept an empty string. Because if x could accept an empty string, then that means that we want to um, we want to start looking in y rather than start looking in x. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of cx and circ that onto y, and then we're going to union that with if x includes um, includes epsilon, then we're going to take the derivative of cy, otherwise we're going to do empty. Now this thing where we can check to see if something is includes empty, um, it's actually quite easy to do this because we know that empty does not, epsilon does, a character doesn't, a union does if either side does, a star always does, and um, a circ does if both of them do. So it's easy to write this, uh, write this uh, by hand. Now, something that's interesting 
is, is that these operations um, actually derive extremely fast um, extremely fast implementations of doing regular expressing matching much much faster than converting to regular expressions themselves and I highly recommend uh, googling um, Michael Greenberg and you can look at a post that he wrote called um, smart constructors are smarter are smarter than you think and in it he talks about um, implementing this idea and comparing it. These things are called Brzezowski derivatives. It's a, a tool with regular expressions. Alright, so that's kind of um, enough for now talking about uh, what regular expressions can do. Um, one thing that you could do, for instance, is you could, uh, you could write a function that walks through a regular expression and performs these kinds of operations, uh, optimizations. You could see that, aha, look, there's a union, and the left-hand side is null, and let's you know, reduce it to just A. That would be a way of uh, shrinking the size of, um, of regular expressions. All right. But now, these regular expressions, what we've done is we've shown that there's a path from regular expression down to NFA, down to DFA. We also know that there's a path from DFAs up to NFAs, and what that does is it shows us that NFAs and DFAs are equally powerful. Here's a question. Can I convert a DFA into a regular expression? i.e., is it possible to do that? Because if it were possible, that would tell us that not only are regular expressions a interesting and useful way to come up with DFAs and write down regular languages, they would in fact be um, equally as expressive as NFAs and DFAs themselves. Of course, I would only be mentioning this if yes, in, in fact, this is possible. Let's think a little bit more broadly about this. If this arrow exists, then that means that, like, you know, what are regular expressions really? Regular expressions are basically like a programming language for DFAs. It's really painful to write down meticulously all the various states um, that you uh, that that might show up in whatever problem you're thinking about. But it's really easy to come up with a regular expression. So regular expressions, you can kind of think of them as like the C programming language. And it's much more pleasant to write in the C programming language than it is to write to directly in assembly. So regular expressions are like programming languages, and DFAs are like machines. And it's nice to use programming languages rather than machines directly. But although we've demonstrated that we can have a compiler from C down to assembly, it would be very in interesting to show that we can turn assembly back into C. Now it turns out that in the real world, assembly typically cannot be turned back into our high-level languages because our high-level languages often can break rules that, sorry, our assembly can often break rules that our high-level languages enforce. Here's a little example. So in Java, um, it's not possible to take a string and add it to a boolean, both because the addition operation doesn't make sense on strings or booleans in the first place, but also because the two of them are totally distinct different kinds of values. But nevertheless, ultimately, both of those things, strings and booleans, are turned into something that the underlying assembly language understands, and the underlying under assembly language on at least you know the x86, this kind of computer that I'm using, um, it only has concepts for numbers. So that means that ultimately all data structures are numbers at the assembly level. So that means that at the assembly level, it is possible to add strings and booleans together. But, um, but that, of course, doesn't make sense as a high level. So decompilers that take assembly and turn it back up into our high-level language typically have to identify patterns that show up 
um, in the assembly that they know correspond to the way that they compiled. But we're going to be able to show that we can take any DFA, no matter how it was produced, and turn it back into a regular expression. And that'll be the topic of next class.